Hi everyone, welcome to the CAS YouTube channel. And I'm so pleased to have our guest today, Justin Rathbon, production sound mixer, Tony Volante, re-recording mixer, and Rob Fernandez, re-recording mixer for the Broadway musical hit Hamilton, which was also uh, recently a 57th CAS award recipient for their work uh, on the film. So thanks for being here today, guys. Good to see you. Well, thanks for having us, Michael. Going well. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, appreciate you guys being here. Yes, um, and we're we are missing one member of the crew, Tim Latham, who shared the award with us. He yeah. was, wasn't available today, but um, um, this is the first time I've been able to meet uh, Justin in person, which is kind of nice. For sure. Yeah, same goes for me. It's some incredible work. So. Yeah, re really great to have you guys here. And uh, one of the focuses here on the CAS YouTube channel is to uh, inspire, motivate, educate, not only other professionals in the craft, but also uh, other filmmakers and other crafts and students who are, you know, learning and trying to work on the type of productions that you guys work on. So why don't we go ahead and just start off basically with just some introductions. I'd, um, I'd like to get a sense of what your role was on Hamilton and talk a little bit about uh, what that role is and the role that you played. So Justin, we can just go ahead and start with you if you'd like. Sure, sure. Uh, well, my name is Justin Rathbun. I am the uh, A1 and production sound mixer for Hamilton on Broadway. I do the show eight times a week. Um, and uh, it's it's a very busy show, and it's been uh, quite a wild ride since uh, the production opened in August of 2016 on Broadway. Um, for the uh, for the Hamilton film, I was uh, responsible for all of the capture, um, as well as uh, the uh, background tracks and uh, basically all of the material um, that was uh, set back to be uh, masterfully re-recorded by uh, the gen other gentlemen on this call, including Tim. Um, so that's that's basically my responsibility to the production. Tony, uh, if go ahead and uh, so you were uh, the re-recording mixer or one of the re-recording mixers on the show. I was, yeah. Um, I uh, was introduced to the show by Chris Richard, um, and introduced me to Tommy and, and the whole Hamilton world. And um, after being able to watch the show live to get a sense of how, uh, how it sounded and the wonderful work and, and sound that it was live, to try to recreate that in a film version was, was uh, the task at hand. This was, this was much more unique in that everything was recorded all at once. So it was one capture of sound and beautifully done, I must say. And we had Tim, Tim do a premix, a stereo premix. He was the most familiar with, with the music. Uh, so he did a stereo premix, handed that off to me where I went on a film stage at Harbor, Harbor Pictures and did a, uh, 7.1 mix um, along with a 5.1 mix and stereo mix and this show was unique in that it was 99% music it was like two hour long piece of music uh, without you know dialogue per se um, and without tons of effects and things like that it was but, but mostly just a music mix um but being a re-recording mixer with a background in in music recording uh, i was able to combine both both talents of music mixing and what i've learned through uh feature film mixing and then it got handed off to to roberto who did a uh uh, Atmos mix and did all the final tweaks and, and final notes uh, on all of the, uh, you know, the final delivery of the product for Disney plus. And, and, and Rob, th tell us about your um, introduction to the show and how you got involved 
And do is, is yourself and Tony, have you guys worked together on uh, previous shows? We've worked together on previous shows, but but sort of like the same as uh, as this one, in which uh, he handed it off to me and and uh, uh, and and on a pretty sudden <laughs> fashion. Uh, I just I got a phone call, I believe, I don't know, February of last year, uh, just as the pandemic was hitting. That uh, if I could help in, in finishing up Hamilton. Uh, Tony was busy on another project. He couldn't finish it. So um, uh, uh, very, you know, he filled me in on what needed to be done. And uh, he said that that was, I remember, I think I remember him telling me that everything he thought needed to be done was probably 50% of what needed to be done because the whole creative team will, you know, will probably add a lot to that workload. Uh, so I had to familiarize myself with the, with the show uh, as quickly as possible. Just listen to Tony's mix, which was, I mean, it was pretty much in shape uh, to be theatrically released as a 7-1 mix. Uh, but we needed to bring it to Admos. So um, I started combing through the tracks, getting myself familiar with the tracks. Uh, Tony gave me a great roadmap on how to attack that. And uh, as I said before, Justin did an amazing job of capturing this show. I mean, this is what made it possible for I imagine Tony and myself to do the job uh, in the amount of time given and because uh, he not only captured it was, a, it was a, a great capture of the music and the performances of all the principal uh, principles in the show but he also captured the entire the room the audience the laughs the reactions um, and, and all of that became the, the the foundation for the Atmos mix to fill the room and to try to make the audience feel like they were on stage Again, all credit goes to Justin and Tony because what they handed me was amazing work. So I just had to finish it and then I had to like be, you know, interact with the creative team and make sure I implemented all their, their last minute notes. Question for you, Rob, right off the bat, um, just something that comes to mind is, is the Disney Plus platform a compatible delivery for an Atmos format? You most definitely can. And as a matter of fact, I am the proud owner of a new Atmos home Atmos system and I have done this and yes you can definitely hear the Atmos uh, the Atmos mix at home but there's different ways to achieve Atmos at home so it's not necessarily uh, you know having more speakers because it can be achieved through reflections and you know there's sound bars that uh, claim to do Atmos I haven't tested those but I have heard the uh, the uh, ceiling firing speakers and those uh, I thought work uh, so um, so that so that's the difference I mean Atmos is an object based system so it, it's not you know you don't have to have uh, it scales to the size of the room that you're playing back in so what are some of the challenges that you have to think about when creating an Atmos mix knowing that not everyone has an Atmos system that you could have you know, uh, end users on laptops, watching on mobile devices. Are there considerations that are taken into place? Well, I have to say the first thing you have to take into account is how much time do you have? And, and in this particular case, you know, Disney gave us all the time needed. So, so I knew that, like I asked from the beginning, like I knew that once the, um, almost, almost mix was delivered, that I would then spend some time on the five one mix and then I will spend some time on the stereo mix and since I had that time uh, I'd made adjustments to both um, so that's that's the compromise I have to make you you can have it automatically uh, you know um, uh, generated but it, it, if you if, if you go in that route then you have to listen to it throughout the mix to make sure you know when you get to very loud sections or sections that are very uh, low, low and heavy and things like that, you have to check to see how it's folding down. If you don't think you're going to have time at the end to make adjustments to those other mixes, to the five one and the stereo. So Justin, I, I'd love to ask you some questions about the capture because you were there for the filming, which I believe uh, Justin was done over three days and 2016 was when it was actually captured, correct? Um, we, yeah, we captured it over three days. We did, uh, uh, we captured it with three different audiences. 
during those three days, we would come in in the morning and also uh, they would set up decking all over the seating where the audience would usually sit and uh, we'd have massive camera setups in there and it was uh, it was fascinating. Uh, it's not something that you typically see in a Broadway theater at all. So, you know, being a production sound mixer myself, the first thing that I couldn't help but, you know, look for and notice and thinking about is, you know, starting with the use of placement of microphones. Um, you know, I, I, I notice, uh, you know, right off the top in Lin-Manuel Miranda's uh, costume and his look that we had, it looks like two lavaliers uh, in the hair. And also, you know, depending upon the wardrobe, if someone didn't have much hair, uh, you know, they could be using a single ear set. Talk about some of the thought that went into with the team on the production set as far as choosing which microphones um, and placements and how that came about. Sure. Um, well, Devin Steinberg, the sound designer for Hamilton on Broadway, um, had originally come up with an idea of, uh, of what microphones we were going to use. Uh, and we primarily use DPA 4061s. Uh, now we're using uh, the core model of uh, uh, DPA 4061s, as well as the 6061s, um, since those have come out. Um, but uh, between DPA or uh, Sennheiser MKE1s, um, is primarily what we are using um, on the cast. Um, depending on what they're doing on stage or their role on stage, uh, depends on which kind of microphone they have. Um, primarily the ladies would wear the 4061s uh, in, on their wig cap, like up near, up near their temple, usually a little bit off center, um, you know, from your, from your nose, because you're, you know, crazy enough. Your nose gets in the way when you're recording things and it, it, can, mm -hmm. uh, it, can, uh, it can color the sound a little bit. Um, for Lynn, we used uh, two uh, Sennheiser Mickey ones, and those are the ones that you can see in the film. Um, and the reason he's wearing two is uh, that, uh, as you can imagine, Hamilton is a very intense show, not only for the lead actor, but for everybody else on stage. So we really needed to take um, perspiration into effect and uh, the possibility of sweating out microphones. Um, so those two microphones are essentially running in tandem uh, all at the same time, they're running uh, to the front of house mix. They're, they were running to uh, the capture mix as well. Um, so if there was one problem, uh, whether it be wireless, whether it be perspiration, whether it be some kind of coloring, that you could immediately transfer to that backup. And it's a, it's a identical, uh, cl as close to identical as you could get backup. And, and how many channels, I have to ask, if you know, I know I'm throwing a lot of this uh, you know, here in the moment just in conversation, but I mean, how many channels of wireless did you guys have deployed just for talent and and what were what went into choosing which systems and what kind of systems did you guys go with sure sure um we are running a total of 36 channels of wireless uh sennheiser em 3732 with uh the sennheiser sk5212 uh belt packs um and then we are also running uh eight channels of the shore um uh, it's the new wireless handheld system, um, uh, the digital wire wireless. The, uh, system. Is, are, is that the Axiant system, perhaps? Or uh, I believe it is the Axiant system. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Um, but uh, the reason we went with Sennheiser is just because the uh, the size of the transmitter uh, was is is so wonderful uh, as uh, as well as the sonic quality that comes out of them. Uh, the, the companing that happens in some of the Sennheiser gear is uh, it colors the sound a lot less than it does in some of the other manufacturers, at least in my experience. So, you know, something that that really intrigued me and was thinking about is I didn't hear I didn't see <laughs> any uh, in your monitoring systems for the talents unless they were incredibly discreet. It sounded like the there was the monitors was uh, stage monitoring. Uh, there is only stage monitoring, and uh, one of the ways that uh, Nevin, our sound designer, uh, run shows, and a lot of the way a lot of Broadway shows are run, is there is no onstage foldback, vocal foldback. There is onstage band foldback and music foldback and sound effects foldback and stuff like that, but there are never any vocals actually run through the onstage monitors. So uh, throughout the stage, uh, there are uh, speakers pointed back, back up at the either either down or up at the actors, uh, just uh, reproducing the music content only. Originally, when we when when they came in to capture this, uh, originally when it was captured, uh, they were planning to capture it in 48K. And I said, no, 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 no. You're capturing it in 96K. 
one right. or you know 96 192 and yeah. uh and and we're putting a ton of, you know, room microphones in and, you know, okay. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just, just, Justin, talk, talk about yes. some of the, be- the benefits for those maybe who don't know of, of capturing like that. You know, I mean, on a scripted, uh, a lot of work that I do in the industry, the standards 4824, uh, talk about the benefits of, of the 96 and 192 sample rates that, that you were insisting upon they capture in. Um, it's just the re- it, the resolution is 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 twice that of 48k. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Are you getting more samples per you know more samples per second um, than than you would at a 48k? I mean, it just it, you you get more. More is better, right? <laughs> more is more in that case. Yeah, we did some tests. At, you know, like once after the capture, because we couldn't. There was no way we could run our Pro Tools systems at that rate. Uh, with all with the plugins and everything it, it was just impossible um so um we did some tests and the stuff captured at that rate sounds better than if you were to just capture it at straight 48 so even going from a higher bit rate and and down converting somewhere down the line still sounds better uh so you know hats off to you to putting your foot down and, and staying staying to that uh, higher resolution pays, I mean, it paid off so tony when when you actually receive the tracks and and uh from the production teams on set and you first you know had it laid out in the pro tool system from the edit what was your experience what kind of mics uh, that were placed by those teams played a critical role. Was there also uh, room mics available for you in different arrays? Was the stereo configurations, MS configurations? Like, what kind of sources did you have to work with in creating your initial mixes? Well, first of all, um, I want to give a shout out to Dan Timmons and Derek Lee. Um, they they received the material initially and were, did the edit on it. So. Then they handed it off to me, um, and uh, I was and I was great hearing everything that that, uh, that Justin just said. I, I was I learned a lot just in these last few minutes. That was great. Um, so I think you know we there was probably when the tracks got laid out in the Pro Tools session there were probably upwards of two hundred plus tracks. Uh, we had, I believe there were eight stereo pair for room mics, um, scattered throughout the room. Um, you know, we had made suggestions on where to place those, those mics, uh, throughout the theater. I think, uh, the Rogers has this super high, like dome. I think we even stuck a couple mics up there, just in, uh, way up in the, in the dome, just to to see what that would be like thinking, well, maybe for an Atmos mix down the road, that might be kind of fun to use those mics. Um, but, um, with all those mics going, uh, one of the first things we do is go through and, and, and clean up, you know, we, especially the back, all the chorus background singers, um, you know, rather than leaving their mics open throughout the whole live show, we go in there and, and literally clean up uh, in between where they're singing so that their mics are only on when they're singing and then it's completely in silence when they're not. And pretty much do that with, with all the live mics on stage, uh, all the singing, singing mics. Um, that cleans up so much unwanted room reflection and gives us much more control uh, when it comes, comes to, uh, comes to you know creating the the sound space that we want to create uh the band is is pretty straightforward you know typical drum uh layout of maybe a dozen drum tracks some additional percussion tracks um some machine percussion tracks um there's some strings um you know guitar bass you know um those are all pretty, pretty straightforward, stay pretty consistent, consistent through the show. Um, 
I, th- I think once we got the tracks, uh, you know, the, the thing that initially struck me was uh, starting with the first song, Alexander Hamilton, like we wanted, you know, I wanted to set up uh, that first song had to kind of set the stage, if you will, uh, for the soundscape, you know, how, how much room balance to direct signal that we wanted to, to have. Um, create the spatial effect that we wanted to have. So that that first song was very critical. I probably spent the most time mixing that first song than any of the other songs. Um, It was critical, you know, to start the show with, you know, with the, with the setup that was going to kind of be the, the template for the rest of the rest of the show. Um, So we do a couple of things right off the bat, you know, the, the singers come in from off stage, uh, you know, left and right, and so I, I wanted to pan them in, so that you, you know, sonically you hear them come from that side of the stage, and you hear them come from this side of the stage, so that right from the get go, from the very very beginning, as a listener, you're already used to, oh, this is going to be happening. I'm going to be able to follow people around on the stage as opposed to just placing them straight up the middle um, right from the get go. And so that it was just a, a way of sort of uh, getting getting people used to what they're going to, going to hear for the rest of the show, just a s- small sampling. Um, but during the mix, uh, I should certainly mention that, you know, uh, Tommy Kale, the director, would would come in for our our final playbacks. Alex Lackamore, the musical director, and and Nevin Steinberg, that Justin had mis- mentioned earlier, um, sound designer of the show. I kind of call them the the uh, and, and Jonah and Jonah actually the uh, Moran the uh, the picture editor, who uh, is also a fabulous. If he wasn't a picture editor, he'd be a great sound editor as well. Um, they those those were like the big four that were in the room with me when uh you know i would spend maybe a week or two by myself pre-mixing and then they would come in for a week or so and mix with me uh at various stages so uh it's always a team effort uh you know um you know i lay the foundation and then i work with 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 the creatives and and we come up with the final final product but they uh one one thing i've I've done a lot of uh, (laughs) done a lot of mixing for a lot of years and i was completely blown away by the artistry and professionalism and for those i thought uh, not to interrupt me but those who are not aware some of the research i did um donald fagan uh you work with him uh with from steely dan and and roger daltrey Mm -hmm. from the who so you you had you know uh you know you had mentioned your music background but you've actually worked you know that's a big compliment you know coming from your background yeah i mean i you know i didn't know uh yeah i i've mixed some other broadway uh shows before um so i um i think that's maybe why i was chosen to mix this particular show but um i really i, I wasn't i didn't know what to expect when they came in initially to, to work with me, you know, to, uh, and, and, um, we connected right off the bat and, uh, we've worked on other projects since then. Um, and it's, it's just been a wonderful experience, but I, yeah, the, uh, the level of talent, I guess, if you will, just, uh, I was, was off the charts. And I, th- I think, uh, what was maybe unique for me on, 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 and I feel kind of bad for, for Rob, that he didn't get to experience it because he had to do his work during the pandemic, unfortunately, and only uh, was conversing with them, you know, remotely, as well with me. Um, but um, I, I luckily mixed this before the pandemic and got to, you know, enjoy everyone's camaraderie and so uh, uh, in the studio, which is kind of why we all do this. Uh, you know, that's the best part you know, was working together and, uh, you know, 
coming up with these magical ideas and things that, that only happen when you're in the same room together. The room where it happened, as, as they say. And I want to jump on that real quick. Like it, that doesn't only translate just to just to Tony's experience. That has translated to my experience as well. And working, we're, we're working with these guys for for many years now. Not just on, not just on uh, on Hamilton, but on In the Heights before that, and uh, you know, yeah. Freestyle Love Supreme with that. And you know, like these guys bring that to the table on every show that they do. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful group of people. And and. and- and Rob, what was that experience like for you? First of all, being like, where did you mix it? And, and, and how were the reviews done and sharing with others, considering all the shutdowns and protocols? Uh, well, yeah, like I said before, I think the first phone call happened in February uh, of last year, so just before the shutdown. Uh, so uh, it was mixed at Harbor, um, Studio A at Harbor. Uh, which I think is where Tony did most of his work. Um, it is. Yeah, that's and, where, I, where uh, I did. And it was uncharted territory. I mean, we, I, I, I had to learn on the fly, not only, you know, how to mix this show, but how to mix in a pandemic world. Um, so, uh, so most of the playbacks, uh, the first few rounds were, was mo- were mostly about content and placement, which you know, stereo is fine to do that uh, with. Um, so, you know, we had shared documents online, they would post their notes, I would implement them, I would, you know, let them know ahead of time when the next file would be coming, I would send it out. Uh, I think Jonah's the only one that was receiving 5.1. He was able to play it back in his, in his the, you know, editorial setup, I think he still had. Um, so, that was a back and forth. I think we had a couple of like Zoom sessions where we were all, uh, you know, on screen. Uh, but but after that, I think it was all, you know, Google Docs and things like that, that we would just be exchanging notes and sending it out. Uh, then towards the end, uh, we sent the Atmos mix to Disney um, for them to review. And the seven one mix, if I remember correctly, the executives reviewed that one uh so then we started getting you know full like mixed playback notes um but uh but yeah it was the, my first mix in a pandemic and trial by fire and also a special thank you to harbor for letting us borrow you guys tell us about the mix room over there uh and the environment the size of the room maybe a little bit about some of the monitors you're using and so forth to create these atmos mixes um, well, like I said, we're mixing Studio A. Uh, that's sort of uh, our medium uh, theatrical room at uh, Harbor. Uh, we have a larger stage and a smaller stage than that. Um, I believe all the speakers are JBLs in that room, except for the subs that are Myers. Uh, i trying to remember off the top of my head. I think there's like 12 uh, Admiral speakers in that room. Tony, I don't know if you have memory better than mine on that. You know, um, I think, yeah, 12 channels, I think. But it right. sounds correct. I don't know if I ever bothered to look up and count. I know that I grant this 40, but um, yeah. I think, I I think what was, what's, uh, I think what was interesting is I believe when I mixed in A at the time, I don't think it was an Atmos room. Yeah, I think I you're right. Think it was, yeah, I don't think happened, it was an Atmos. It happened room. just before the pandemic. Yeah, so I was put up the Atmos. I was mixing seven one, but at the, all along we were, you know, saying, "Look, I mean, when I was mixing, we were thinking this is not going to be released for several years, so we were always thinking ahead, like, okay, we'll come back to this a few years from now, and of course we'll do an Atmos pass then. So when th- things got uh, accelerated. Um, and we had to do an Atmos pass pass much quicker, um, but uh, I, in seven one, I, I was always as I was mixing it, I was always thinking ahead, like for Atmos, like how things would eventually go in Atmos. You know, if there's a, a cannonball shot that starts in the rear left in seven one and ends up in the front right, uh, it still sounds pretty cool in in seven one. 
but I always knew like, well, in, in Atmos, uh, you know, I, I was looking forward to having some fun with that, but I'm sure Rob had some fun with that. Just, you know, maybe passing it over. We could use some, you know, a little more directional speakers now and, and, you know, or send it up into the ceiling a little bit. So there's a couple of moments like that, that I knew that in Atmos would be super fun to do. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that for the, you know, a difference with mixing during the pandemic is that uh, there was a lot, a lot of time management has to go into the mix more than a regular mix. Cause since the clients are not in the room with you and you don't get that instant uh, feedback. So you have to sort of like space it out and know that, okay, I'm going to send out a mix for them to review, let's say the first three songs or something while I'm working on the next three songs because you don't instantly, you're not instantly going to get notes back. Um, and then um, I, I remember thinking when, when I first started doing that and, and, it, and, it, and it worked and it worked great, but I remember thinking, um, oh, you know, I, I think this method works fine. Like you send, you send the clients a file, they review it, you know, they can play it back as many times as they want and they can give you detailed, but I was getting really, really detailed notes. Wow. And uh, and I was very well. Maybe this method, you know, is not going to work because at this level of detail, this is going to take forever. And uh, you know, only like I think, I think talking to Tony or something, I learned that that's the way these guys work. It doesn't matter that <laughs> yeah. I'm sending them files. <laughs> they <laughs> always give you really, really detailed notes. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so, I wish we had uh, some of the pictures uh, of of some of those uh, spreadsheets. That, that that were being used for you, Rob, that had the uh, color coding and breakdown of who was giving notes and priority and which had been done. I mean, it was this huge spreadsheet, uh, very well thought out, uh, very well organized. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. and Alex has this amazing ear. Uh, you know, he would give you like, you know, this note on, you know, on the third bar of the song, the second note is, you know, it's out of, it's, it's the wrong pitch or something. But you can find this note if you go to the fourth song on the third note, and you can steal <laughs> that note from so, so yeah, it, the, the and, level of detail is mind boggling. And, ju and just so our viewers know, Rob, Alexander played which role? The, the notes well, Alex coming from Lackamore, Alexander? He's the, he, was the, he was the musical director. The musical director, got it. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the music and where the musicians uh, are arranged in the performance and in the theater and how that process works, Justin. Uh, there's an orchestra pit actually underneath the stage. Uh, if you uh, if you view the film, you can see a little a little little box like, you know, looking like that on the very front of the stage. There's a little box and you'll see a head pop out of there every now and then. That's a conductor for the show. Uh, there are actually video monitors on the balcony rails that uh, that uh, we have a video camera shooting at him so he can conduct them and, and get them all to come in at the same time. Uh, as well, there are video monitors down uh, in the pit. So he's sitting at the stage level. And then underneath that, there's a hole, you know, maybe eight feet down. There's a That's where the orchestra pit is. So that's where uh, the musicians are. Uh, there's a drum booth down there that is sealed off from everybody else just to try to get some uh, isolation from the string section. Um uh, and then, uh, you know, next to him, there's a percussionist, there's plexiglass between them so they can communicate, uh, you know, uh, you know, by looking at each other, uh, the bass player, guitar player, a couple of, another keyboard guitar, uh, and then four string players. Um, and they're all down there in the pit and then they're all playing together all at the same time. Yeah. At the end of the show, I think Alex comes out and. Uh, at the end of the show, and at the end of at the end of one of the rap battles, uh, one of the uh, one of the guys hands a microphone to him, and then uh, uh, and then uh, at the beginning of Act Two, uh, the male two, uh, which is one of our ensemble members, actually pops out of the pit at the beginning of Act Two. That's how he enters oh. the stage. <laughs> yeah. Justin, I got one more question for you. What kind of sure. mics, uh, what kind of room mics are being used, are, are deployed in the theater? Like, what is the array and type of microphone choices you have? Um, we put those up specifically for, for, the, uh, for the capture. Um, I want to say they were, I want to say they were Sennheiser MKH 840s um, that we used everywhere. I, I, I believe that's the model number that we used, but we put them in specifically for the capture. Um, 
and uh, you know, I, uh, like Tony said, I think there were eight eight plates throughout the room. Um, I think there were like three on three on the left side of the house, three on the right side of the house, three in the center of the house, several up at the balcony, a couple in some other corners and stuff like that. I mean, it was um, we 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 tried to play somewhere we thought they would. Uh, and weren't there some on stage, or the stud, or the mics on stage are always there? The ones weren't there some on the rig on stage? Do I, I, I there, not we might have thrown a couple up there. I don't even remember anymore. That was yeah. I thought there were there. some I'd on stage. Yeah. Yeah, there might be. No. That stage is noisy. <laughs> yeah, what were some of the what were some of the sources that were you were having to deal with? Was lighting on lighting grids or what were some uh, of the, the sources that, that were, were challenging? Yeah. No, I mean the stage creaks a lot because the theater is a hundred years old. Uh, the air conditioner, the HVAC mm -hmm. in that in that place uh, has a mind of its own. So sometimes it'll be blowing like there's a hurricane on stage, and sometimes it'll be quiet as a mouse. Um, um, the light, the lighting rig is actually fairly quiet. Um, it's all LED yeah. fixtures, and um, there are some movers in there, and you do hear some noise every now and then. But uh, they usually. Um, anytime the movers are doing anything drastic, it's usually during something that's fairly intense or loud on stage. So, Well, thank you guys. I learned so much today about your process and congratulations again on your uh, CAS award and your achievement for what is just masterful work. And, um, and also thank you to our viewers uh, for being here and um, watching and Please subscribe to the channel for future videos and we appreciate you and we'll see everyone soon.